Tonight, the Albanese government's censorship war goes crazy and a senator now defies the government by posting the footage it wants banned from Twitter and says, F you to the Prime Minister. Also tonight, a group representing Palestinian teachers in our schools says they're going to teach against Anzac Day to our children. Plus, why is this comedian being picked on for wanting a woman to take her baby out of his show when she couldn't even keep it quiet in an interview that was given to her to complain? She's uh, yeah, and hey, super cranky right now. OK, ma maybe she can go to Dad just for a quick second. The entitled society. Plus, a Labor minister says he wants... Uh, she wants a treaty to give people identifying as Aboriginal a share of money from wind farms and mines. Plenty more, including Matt Canavan. But first, Anthony Albanese's war against Twitter boss Elon Musk. It today got more vicious, it got more cynical, more hypocritical and more dangerous to you. Today, the Prime Minister played the class war card against Musk and abused him for saying Australia shouldn't be trying to stop the whole world from seeing the stabbing attack in Sydney on a Christian bishop. It just shows his arrogance. This is uh, an egotist, totally out of touch. He clearly uh, sees this as a vanity project for himself. That's not Albanese putting an argument. That's him appealing to the mob with cheap abuse of a scapegoat. But then came the hypocrisy, plus more abuse. Well, this is a bloke who's chosen ego and showing violence over common sense. Uh, I think that Australians will shake their head when they think that this billionaire is prepared to go to court fighting for the right to sow division and to show violent videos. Such hypocrisy. But before I show you why, two things to remember. The first is that the left now hates Elon Musk. I mean, he bought Twitter after getting sick of its censorship of conservatives. It had even banned Donald Trump. So Musk is now a hate figure of the left. So that's important background. Oh, the second thing to remember is that Musk is not some sociopath demanding the right to sow division. Albanese is just defaming him. No, he's actually serious about free speech. So when the Albanese government's e-safety commissioner, a disgruntled former Twitter employee, by the way, told Musk to take down this stabbing footage or, or risk eight hundred or nearly $800,000 a day in fines, Musk tweeted this, that we face the choice here between free speech or censorship and government propaganda. And it's also tweeted this question, should the safety commissioner, an unelected official, official in Australia, have authority over all countries on earth about what they read on Twitter? Which is a great question. And yesterday in the federal court, the government's demonisation of Musk started to look even more cynical. The safety commissioner was applying for and got a temporary injunction on Twitter from showing the stabbing footage in Australia, even though her own barrister admitted in court that actually, well, this footage is probably out there on other platforms, so it might be said there's a degree of futility in granting an injunction in these circumstances. And indeed, the judge seemed to agree. Now, that sounds to me like a government trying to make an example of Twitter without making a real difference. But then came the, this argument, one that the Albanese government is running hard on. The e-safety commissioner's barrister actually claimed this is a graphic and violent video. There will be irreparable harm if it's on Twitter. This kind of material can be co-opted by those seeking to fan public anger. Irreparable harm? Now I know we're being conned. This video, yes, shows a graphic act of violence. You can understand the government's panic because here is a Christian bishop being stabbed, allegedly, by a boy from a Muslim family. And the government is freaking. I mean, what might Muslims say? What might some Christians do? Censor it. I mean, it's much easier than actually doing something, you know, or facing up to the possible consequences of our unsafe levels of mass immigration, our divisive multiculturalism, our new tribalism, all of which has been encouraged by governments. But just look at the footage itself. How violent is it really? Now, I know the attack is awful, but the bishop is already out of hospital. He's not dead. And let me now compare and contrast. Right now, on the ABC... For instance, 
I can see body cam footage of a killing of white police from Alice Springs shooting in self-defense, said by a jury, shooting an Aboriginal man, Kumanjayi Walker, who stabbed them with scissors. This is far more violent. And it's also likely to cause division. In fact, you know, you've seen black anger already, you've seen black protests, you've seen calls for vengeance for so-called justice. When we are going to get justice. So why is that video of the fatal shooting still allowed even on the national broadcaster's site when a non-fatal stabbing must be banned from the gaze of the entire world? Is it that the police shooting might stir up Aboriginal hatred of whites, but the stabbing of a Christian bishop might stir feelings about Muslims? And what's actually the precedent here? Here's another thing. We can't see any footage of the next terrorism attack as well, or even of someone maybe punching someone. I mean, where's the line? And must Twitter now also let other countries stop us from seeing what's really happening in their countries too? Like the Charlie Hebdo attack or the Hamas attack on Israel. So that soon, you know, no one knows what's really going on unless some government allows it. I've even heard discussion today. Well, how about cancelling Twitter for Australia? Sealing ourselves off. I mean, what next? Sealing ourselves off from Facebook as well and from TikTok owned by China and shutting them all out until we're, own, we're in our own little hermit kingdom looking only at videos of cute puppies and fluffy kittens and whatever governments deem is safe. I mean, this is seriously mad. And what's making it worse and even more hypocritical is that the Albanese government, meanwhile, does nothing about the kind of people who really do promote division on the internet. It's done flat nothing about the Aussie Cossack, for instance, who's actually just an Australian fugitive from police who spent almost two years hiding from them in the Russian consulate in Sydney, broadcasting pro-Putin propaganda, and is also the one who spread those false and inflammatory rumours that the Bondi Junction killer was actually a Jew called Benjamin Cohen. Totally false. The government's done nothing about him. It's done nothing about Sydney hate preachers like this guy, stirring up hatred and division. No, you are being played. You are being played. Here's the Prime Minister playing class politics, distracting you from the real causes of our division, imposing a censorship that suits governments, and even misusing now this stabbing video for his real business, selling you his controversial plan for even more censorship, his planned misinformation laws. Please don't fall for it. Now, if our government really wanted to stop poisonous division, here's something it should get stuck into instead of censoring Twitter. The Prime Minister today started to walk the Kokoda track in Papua New Guinea in honour of the Anzacs who fought and died there ahead of Anzac Day. Meanwhile, back home, a group called Teachers for Palestine is preaching against Anzac Day to our kids. This Victorian branch says they're not going to glorify the day. They'll resist it. They want to teach how Anzacs, in fact, they were almost all New Zealanders, killed or reported 40 Palestinians in World War I. This was after a Palestinian from a particular village, murdered one of the sergeants, the village wouldn't say who, and a killing spree. Absolutely terrible. There was compensation paid. But does this one event truly define the whole Anzac history? Well, this group said, yes, well, it's important that students know the Anzacs left a long and violent historical imprint in Palestine, which we actually liberated, helped liberate from the Ottomans, by the way, the Turks, This is a legacy to dismantle, not to glorify. And they also want to teach kids about the so-called frontier wars with Aborigines, the mistreatment of returned soldiers, Australian war crimes in Afghanistan, anything bad, really, it seems, and to resist government-funded mystification about Australia's role in wars, which they say crowds out Australia's role in imperialism. I mean, give me a break. As it happens, Senator James Patterson, the opposition's Home Affairs spokesman, he's at least giving a speech tonight warning about exactly this kind of division, which, again, the Albanese government's not tackling. 
Patterson says even the government is warning now about a possible war, China. But how are we going to find the soldiers and sailors and airmen to fight for this country when our shared sense of national identity is now so under pressure? I spoke to Senator James Patterson a short while ago. James Patterson, thank you so much for your time. Look, before I get to uh, Teachers for Palestine, your speech, you warn in a good speech, by the way, you warn in it that past wars have seen politicians here demand conscription for the defence of the nation. The, you know, the threat was so grave. Forcing people to fight Australia, big call. The next time we might have to contemplate that uh, will be possibly, well, it could be in our lifetime, James. Could it actually be quite soon? You don't know. But you worry that we're not united enough for that to be even thought about. Why is that? Andrew, anyone who studied Australian history will understand that conscription was one of the most divisive issues in the 20th century. On three separate occasions, we either went to public ballots about it or had enormously divisive internal debates about it. And I never want to see our country divided like that again. And I never want to see a government force people against their conscience to fight in a war that they don't want to. But if we want to avoid that in the future, given the dark clouds ahead, that demands political leadership now and some tough leadership now. We have to make voluntary service in the Australian Defence Force much more attractive so that we solve the recruitment and retention crisis currently facing the ADF. We also have to spend the money we need to now to acquire the capability we need now to hopefully deter and prevent conflict by being credible and being powerful. And unfortunately, on all of those fronts, the Albanese government is failing. They're going to wait 10 years before they spend anything meaningful on defence instead of today when we need it. Yeah, but there's also a wider cultural issue, isn't there? Um... The, the lack of patriotism, the lack of love for Australia, the lack of a sense of what we're all here for. Um, you, you want people to volunteer to fight for this country, but just right now we've got more than 4,000 fewer people in the armed forces than we want, mm. than we need, and, that, and that's when the armed forces are just very small, too small. What's the problem here? Well, that's exactly right, Andrew. I think there's two issues. One is a kind of policy issue that we can solve. We have to make service in the ADF more attractive by making it more flexible and more fitting with modern life. You shouldn't have to move to the other side of the country take your spouse out of their work, move your kids out of school in order to defend your country. That has to end and we have to make it more flexible. And our Shadow Minister for Defence, Andrew Hastie, will have more to say about that. But as you say, there's a more fundamental underlying cultural problem here, which is we've lost a sense of self-belief, we've lost a sense of self-confidence, we don't teach young people that our country is worth anything, let alone worth defending. And when we advertise to go and sign up to serve in the ADF, it's all about you, it's all about self actualization it's all about your personal journey and growth. It's not about serving our country or our our cause and that needs to change. We need to reinstill that sense of belief in our own country and our own goodness if we're ever going to inspire a generation to sign up and serve. Well, on that very point, James, uh, here you are making your speech at just at the same time that a group called Teachers for Palestine says it wants to teach students about Anzac Day in their way. Uh, they want to teach that uh, Anzacs, uh, in fact, most of them were New Zealanders, committed a war crime against Palestinians more than 100 years ago. That's got to be taught, they say. Uh, the Anzac legacy must be dismantled, not glorified. Uh, the Anzacs were conscripted in, in service of the colonisers. I mean, what is going on here? Andrew, on the one hand, this is offensive, a historical nonsense. It is not an accurate reflection of our history or of Anzac Day. But on the other, it's, it's a deeply dangerous attempt to dismantle one of the last unifying symbols of nationhood in Australia. You know, long after people have trashed our flag, trashed our constitution, trashed our anthem, Anzac Day, and Australia Day as well, Anzac Day is one of those things that has almost universal support, almost universal belief, no matter you're on the left of politics or the right, whether you came here recently or a long time ago. Australians rally around this. And I think it's particularly insidious that even that institution is now under attack and there are people trying to undermine that and it is storing up a whole lot of trouble for us in the future. It is going to raise a generation of people who don't believe there's anything good about our country, anything good about our history, and no nation can prosper, let alone survive in a contested geopolitical environment without any belief in itself. I think that's absolutely right. I was wondering, in fact, if the Prime Minister is wasting uh, a few days walking up and down the Kokoda track, but uh, perhaps uh, pay paying this tribute to soldiers uh, who fought and died there 
is exactly the right thing you should be doing. I don't know. Uh, it seems to me that's probably the case. But um, something else, James, the, Elon, the Albanese government's war against Elon Musk, you know, abusing mm. him so personally as a narcissistic billionaire and the abuse is incredible. Demanding, they are, the footage of the bishop being stabbed be banned from Twitter so that no one in the world can possibly see it. This seems way out of proportion, doesn't it? And a, a real threat to free speech. Andrew, freedom of speech, as you know, is a cornerstone of the philosophy of the Liberal Party and we will never walk away from that. It's why we came out so strongly against the Albanese government's misinformation and disinformation bill. And even though they're going to revise it, if it looks anything in any way, shape and form like the first bill, I know we will oppose it too. Um, of course, you couldn't bro broadcast on your program right now abhorrent violent content. And it is reasonable for a government to insist that the laws that apply to a television station apply to a social media network so that young people are aren't served horrific uh, and troubling images, but uh, it should never seep into political censorship and it should never... I mean, we're not the global free speech censors. We don't have the right to dictate to other countries what they view in their jurisdictions. That's a matter for them. If they want to have this content freely available to their citizens, that's for them to decide. It is not up to the Australian government to dictate to the world what they can see and read and hear. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's a different context. I mean, televisions are put on in people's living rooms, uh, family viewing, here's the news. We do not want to offend people, shock the kids, traumatise people, but just boom, there it is. Whereas on social media, you go looking for it, right? There's a different context there. And in this case, this particular video, awful and violent though it is, did not lead to the death of the bishop. He's out uh, within a week. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas I can find on the ABC's website, right, the shooting of a, an Aboriginal guy that attacked two police with scissors, the Kumanjari Walker case, that's on the ABC website. Someone actually died in that. Mm. That's OK. That's also inflammatory. What's the difference? Well, I want to add to that, Andrew, if you want to see absolutely horrific footage out of Gaza right now, it's freely available on almost every social media platform, including TikTok and Twitter and Meta and others. And I'm really worried about the impact that has on young people. It's one of the reasons why the coalition has pushed very strongly for age verification for young people so they cannot have a social media account until they're old enough to have it. And there's glowing global evidence about the harms of that. Jonathan Haidt, the psychologist from the United States, has a new book out, and he says it is harmful for young people under the age of 16 to be on social media at all, let alone if they're accessing horrific content. And I do note for the record that neither the eSafety Commissioner nor the Albanese government has been aggressively pursuing the horrific vision and footage out of Gaza on social media in the same way that they have been pursuing this, and it's up to them to explain what the difference between those things are. Well, I don't think they should be pursuing that. This is the whole thing. There is a new mood for censorship where even the non-fatal stabbing of the bishop is being censored, in my opinion, to ease community tension between two uh, groups that are a consequence... That tension is in consequence a part of government policies, immigration, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is not the way our multicultural society should be policed. And I wonder whether the Liberals have gone soft on free speech that you, in a panic, didn't want to be seen as siding with the foreign billionaire Elon Musk... Uh, and, and let the government wedge you on that. And you've gone along, your party has gone along with this ban. Well, we've approached this in a very considered way over a number of years, Andrew, particularly following the Christchurch massacre. I, mean, I think everyone would agree the live broadcast of a massacre of innocent people by a terrorist should not be allowed to be made accessible to children. Uh, that is obviously harmful. And I think there's an even fairer question, there's a reasonable question to ask, and we can agree to disagree, that whether the radicalising effect of content like that is uh, should a government should have the right to control within their own jurisdiction. Now, I don't want to take on the role of censor of the world, uh, but when we do have a problem of people being radicalised on Online. We have ISIS beheading videos being freely accessible to children in schools. I think that's a problem for our country and I don't think it's a healthy thing. Yeah, but Twitter and all those uh, social media giants do censor propaganda videos like that. We're not talking here about a propaganda video. We're not talking one about well, look at this and sign up to ISIS or whatever. We're talking, talking about straight coverage of what actually happened. And this is stuff you can see on social media outlets if you choose to. It's not thrust in people's faces mm -hmm. in their living room. I think the uh, coalition needs to have another look at this myself. But James Patterson, you have been a warrior for free speech. I know you're not going to uh, start challenging uh, the leadership uh, on this show, but 
I would plead for a reconsideration of this. Thank you so much indeed for your time. Thanks, Andrew. After the break, the panel on Australia's worst government by far and on how the project scored an own goal trying to defend a woman kicked out of a show because of a crying baby. Let's go straight to my Tuesday panel, Will Kingston, host of Australiana, a weekly podcast from The Spectator on politics and culture. And Sky News host Danica DiGiorgio's new show, Danica and James, had a great start last weekend. Catch it on Sundays at 8pm. Uh, Will, the uh, Prime Minister's brawl with Elon Musk, that's now getting world attention. I see it leading at uh, Drudge and the Drudge Report, for instance, in the US, which I guess is very exciting and rewarding for Anthony Albanese. Yes, exciting for Anthony Albanese, but it shouldn't be exciting for the Australian people, Andrew. The bar for limiting free speech is getting lower and lower. It started with misinformation. Now it's at this vague term, violent and harmful content. Next up will be emotionally traumatic content. This is how free speech dies, Andrew. It dies slowly, but it dies incrementally, and it dies under the loathsome pretext that this is for your own good. This is the most important policy fight in modern Australian history because free speech is the bedrock upon which a functioning democracy works and not enough Australians are paying attention. Wake up, Australia, because when you lose free speech, it's very, very hard to get it back and history tells us that it almost always involves bloodshed. But, Danica, did you uh, buy the government's argument that this is for our own good because uh, no-one wants to see... This, well, plainly some people do. No one wants to see this uh, footage of the bishop being stabbed. No rubbish, Andrew. In the end, I'm an adult. If I want to see that vision, I want to make an informed decision, I want to make my own judgment, that I'm entitled to see that vision. What Australia is doing right now is going down a very dangerous censorship pathway where the government wants to tell us what to think, how to think, what we can see and what we can't see. And once we start going down that pathway, where does it end? Who is a Canberra bureaucrat in their corner office to tell us what we should and should not see? Andrew, we've seen this happen all around the world. In Canada, they're facing the same legislation and they're going down a pathway where a bureaucrat is playing judge and executioner. We've seen it in Brazil. There's been protests. Uh, Scotland, Ireland, you name it. And it looks like it's coming now to our own backyard. I was a news reporter for 11 years, Andrew, and I was always told, tell the truth, put it out there, show all sides don't hide anything. So the thought of hiding videos and images, it does not sit well with me and I think Australia needs to wake up to this pathway that the government and apparently the Liberal Party want us to go down. Yeah, the Liberal Party is a shock to me. What I find inf particularly infuriating, Will, is uh, not just the government trying to censor this video, but tying it in with its attempt to pass a misinformation bill to censor us all. The stabbing's not misinformation. And by the way, this misinformation bill doesn't apply to government misinformation. That can actually be deadlier. I want to show you this, because I mean this literally. Government misinformation told us that the COVID virus was dangerous, even in the open air. You're clearly nuts. We were locked down inside, and now we read that just in Victoria alone, five young children died from malnutrition and neglect in just 17 months during the pandemic after having zero or little contact with primary health care. And I'm guessing no visitors came along to see what was really going on. Starved to death in Victoria. That's more, that's five more, that's more in 17 months than in all the 19 years before that. How about that misinformation, Will? It's awful, Andrew. It's awful. And what the last few years have shown us is that too much of yesterday's disinformation turns out to be today's truth. And the only way that you reveal awful stories like that is through putting accountability on the government. You cannot hold governments accountable if you don't have free speech and a free press. And the very massive problem here is that it is entirely arbitrary what the government deems to be misinformation and what the government deems to be truth. This is so important, Andrew, and I just fear that not enough people are paying attention. No, five children starving to death during these lockdowns and all that. I mean, it's just, it is so sick, uh, what was done to this state. 
Uh, but you mentioned the Liberals, um, uh, Danica, crumbling on this thing. Now, James Patterson, I just interviewed in there, he's clearly not happy with the Liberals going along with this attempt to ban the uh, footage. What do you reckon is going uh, on with this party? Well, I mean, you know, Andrew, they call themselves here the Liberal Party of Australia. They're supposed to be the so-called champions of free speech, the Liberal champions. Well, they're not doing anything to suggest that their title uh, warrants the word Liberal. And James Patterson was right in what he told you then. We've also heard our other Liberal MPs or other Senators, Alex Antic, saying the same thing, that the thought of going down this pathway actually sends chills up his spine. And as I just said before, I mean, where does it end? Once you start censoring, you stop letting Australians see things, make up their own minds, it certainly doesn't end. And we heard comments the other day as well from the New South Wales Police Commissioner. You'll remember she said you can only trust one source and that's us. One source, she said. Yet we look at what happened. I mean, it's extraordinary. Yeah. You look at what happened over the pandemic. Uh, there were about 4,000 social media posts that were censored by the government because they thought it was misinformation. And, well, would you believe it? It turned out to be true. So once you go down that pathway, who can you trust? I'll, I'll add I should to believe that, the Victorian uh, police... Yeah, well, I should believe the Andrew. Victorian police will that uh, told me uh, George Pell was... a. Uh, a pedophile that told me uh, that there were no uh, there were no uh, Sudanese gangs in Victoria. That told me all sorts of things. <laughs> Look, uh, sorry, but no. But I want to lighten the mood here um, about the entitlement to, in generation. Will um, Arch Barker? I, I don't know. If, he's one of my children's uh, favourite comedians, if not the. He's been getting a spray for asking a woman at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival who had a baby in one of his shows to leave after it cried. It's actually said, no babies, no children in my shows. But uh, this woman still brought the baby along, fuss, fuss, fuss. He's now trying to defend himself. Here he is. I'm distressed, to be honest, that so many people are upset. Uh, it was never my intention. At the time, I did what I thought I had to do to ensure the enjoyment of the audience for the show. But the woman he kicked out actually made his point for him when she went on the project to complain. The project was all ready to go on his side and then kicked out his baby again. Have a look. I just thought it'd be really nice to do something that I hadn't done in a while um, and just sort of get back to sort of a pre-baby me. She's, she's and, yeah, and hey, super okay. cranky right now. OK, maybe she can go to Dad just for a quick second. Um, but, like, you know, a mum yeah, with three I'm little kids, I reckon you need a laugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Will Kingston, Arj Barker, right or not to leave your baby outside a performance like that? <laughs> the left eats their own stories are so immensely satisfying, Andrew. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, of course he was right. This is the awful thing about identity politics. It basically says that my identity as a mother or as a woman is more important than the collective enjoyment of an audience full of people. It's a gross, narcissistic, selfish ideology, which oh, so incidentally yes. is very much at home on the project. Oh, so true. Danica? <laughs> Well, look, Andrew, I get very annoyed when I'm watching uh, a movie. I've gone to the cinema and there is a baby crying and all I want to say is, please, go, please leave. Uh, look, I mean, I don't think she should have taken the baby to a late-night to a late night uh, comedy act, but what I will say is I would have been humiliated if I got kicked out in that way for something, but you know what? Comedians are funny, right? They try and do things in a funny way, so don't take your kids to adult shows. I, I agree, but uh, one day you might change your mind, of course. Right, maybe. <laughs> you maybe. Have the baby yourself. <laughs> maybe. Will Kingston, Danica and Giorgio, thank you both so much for your time. Do you know, I have never had so many people trying to scam me through my phone. It was bad enough, you know, when some, I told you about it, some crook bought, bought my wife's banking details from a hacker and went on a spending spree. But now I'm getting all sorts of phishing expeditions uh, here. Um, that I worry for a lot of people, uh, so many people are trusting. Just yesterday, I got two more text messages, one from Medicare saying, I have a pending refund, if I just hand over my details, and another from Cole saying, my points are about to expire, same con. And a couple of times this month, I also got a call from someone speaking Chinese. Uh, clearly, these scammers are targeting Chinese speakers, you know, 
we've got some money for you, or, uh, you know, your e-tag will run out or something like that. How is this happening? Now, our investigations team here at Sky News have been doing some great work on this sort of thing. And they've now got an exclusive interview with a conman, a, a hacker in prison. Armin Arakelian in Sydney lost $120,000 from his home loan account. You think that you're protected, but you're not. For the stalks in Canada, it was $300,000 in Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's basically it's our yeah. retirement fund that's gone. Both were victims of what's known as SIM swapping or SIM porting, a practice where a criminal transfers your phone number onto their phone. Sky News has spoken exclusively with a hacker behind bars in America who used the scheme to steal tens of millions of dollars. His warning spills the beans on how criminals do it. We've changed his name and voice to conceal his identity. All that requires is someone willing to break a few rules and put a few pieces together. And by pieces, I mean getting an insider at a mobile phone carrier or, or figuring out a clever way to trick an employee of that carrier and deporting someone's phone number onto their SIM card. Jesse, as we'll call him, says vulnerabilities often exist with overseas-based call centres. These guys who work at these carriers, they don't make a lot of money, John. And a lot of the customer support representatives are based in the Philippines where they make often dollars a day. So if you go and offer that person a couple of hundred dollars, they're really going to seriously consider that. If you look at your phone and you see the word SOS at the top of the phone, that means that you're no longer connected to the mobile network. The New South Wales Cybercrime Squad points out SIM swapping has its roots in 2001, when we were first allowed to keep our phone numbers as we jumped between carriers. If they're successful and they gain control of that mobile phone number, they then have access to all of the SMS verification codes that you would receive from your banks, your, your, your financial providers, your MyGov account. I'm telling him like live, like, you know, my accounts are being drained right now. Like, shut, shut it down. Shut my account down. Armin's hacker simply had his Optus username and login. I was beside myself. I didn't know what else to say or do. And because that phone number was now in the possession of the hacker, I could not be authenticated. Jesse says victims aren't targeted at random, but chosen from databases being traded online with their personal information and prospective wealth, especially when it comes to Bitcoin. A telltale sign can be an increase in scam emails. He also warns people against trusting two-factor authentication. He believes random passcodes can be harder to crack. Once I have access to your mobile phone with any two-factor authentication done by any organisation, you are in big trouble. Police encourage biometric measures, meaning fingerprints and face checks. Face ID in particular, if you can enable that on your bank accounts, that's, that's an excellent option because that means that the only person that can open that account is you. If you see SOS on your phone, contact your carrier immediately and get ready to potentially block your accounts. Which joining me is Jonathan Lee. Jonathan, now that you've uh, scared us, it's up to you to tell us about <laughs> how much of our identity is actually wrapped up in these phone numbers and what can we do to protect ourselves because uh, I've already been hit uh, once in the last year. I don't want to be hit again. Yeah, good evening to you, Andrew. Good evening to everyone at home. It's not the case that SIM swapping is more prevalent at the moment, but certainly in the world of scams, this is amongst the most sinister and amongst the most dangerous. Why? Well, with other scams, you might sign away sums of money, but in this, you can lose your entire family fortune, in effect, over the course of a weekend and not actually know that it's happened to you. As we heard there with Armin, he was away camping, didn't realise when his phone had lost signal that he was actually being scammed and his SIM number had actually been ported onto another telephone. It's simply the nature and the dangerous nature of this scam, which scares people so much. Uh, viewers will know that we tackled SIM swapping once before and it was a, as a consequence of that that we reached out to this scammer who was actually in jail in the United States. He, I suppose, kindly has belled the cat and talked about how it happens. And I suppose what really shocks me is the explanation that so many people's details, especially with things like Bitcoin, are being bought and traded online, which means when you get targeted, perhaps when you start to see an increase in phishing emails, it means they know you have something and they're coming after you. So that's always worth considering. And also the fact that some of the weak points here are the telecommunication uh, outlets overseas in the likes of the Philippines, they only earn a few dollars. So when you throw perhaps a few hundred dollars at them to help move a, 
a, a SIM number onto another telephone, they're more likely to do it. I want to give you some news, though, that you can use. I'm going to bring up a graphic now and show you at home perhaps what you can be thinking about when it comes to these scams and how best to avoid them. Set up a burner email. This is something police talk to us about, which is somewhere all of your scam emails can go to. You have to sign up at a restaurant, use that as your email address. It helps give you better privacy. Enable the biometric checks. This is something the telcos are moving towards, also the big banks. It means fingerprints and face scanners. It makes it much, much harder for you to be scammed. Avoiding links, clicking on them. Well, we've known that for a while. Using an authenticator instead of 2FA, two-factor authentication, or authentication. What that means is you can actually get something through Microsoft, which will send a number to your perhaps your computer rather than using that text message. The danger with the text message is that if the crim has taken control of your telephone and then starts to get those text messages, it's much easier to get access to everything. And use secure email providers, things like Gmail and Yahoo. This is an area, Andrew, which is only going to get worse. We need to make sure that we hunker down and use technology also for our benefit rather than just putting us at risk. Yeah, I even had an um, email just last week uh, purportedly from my uncle saying, what about these photos, you know, signed and all that? Um, again, scam. I mean, it's yeah. just unbelievable. How many thieves are out there now? Jonathan Lee, thanks a lot for yeah. your time. Really yeah. appreciate it. After the break, Donald Trump's first day on trial after allegedly paying off a stripper to shut up. Already, this whole thing looks like a con job. Now let's catch up with the Banana Republic of America. So the first day of evidence overnight in the first of now four criminal cases launched by Democrat prosecutors against Republican Donald Trump ahead of this year's election. It's almost like this is a deep state plot, really, isn't it? To stop him uh, beating Joe Biden in November. Trump faces 34 charges of false accounting and allegedly paid porn star Stormy Daniels via lawyer Michael Cohen to shut up about their alleged affair. And listed the payments to Cohen in the books as legal expenses, which makes me ask, what was he supposed to call them? It's a case as to bookkeeping, which is a very minor thing in terms of the law. This is a case where you pay a lawyer, he's a lawyer, and they call it a legal expense. That's the exact term they use, legal expense, in the books. This is a Biden witch hunt to keep me off the campaign trail. Joining me is Donald Trump's first White House spokesman as president, Sean Spicer. Sean Spicer, thank you. Uh, great to see you again uh, after your week off with the Navy Reserve. You're an officer there. Uh, good to see you hale and healthy. Um, what did the opening day of this trial of Donald Trump tell you? Well, there wasn't a, a ton of testimony. Uh, the former head of the AMI, American Media, that owns the National Enquirer, began his testimony. So there wasn't a lot, per se. But I think what it did was it revealed how silly this is. Remember, and I think this is important for your viewers um, to, to, to grasp, right? So this normally would be considered a misdemeanor offense in New York. Uh, in fact, it's not just a misdemeanor, but the statute of limitations, the time that you have to prosecute that fell way by the wayside years ago. This is a, you know, no pun intended, a trumped up charge. Um, and furthermore, what they did was they created a bunch, took a bunch of smaller charges and tried to combine them together, Andrew, and claim that this was really about the 2016 election. Well, if that's the case, the Federal Election Commission and the Department of Justice have already passed on looking at violations to this. So somehow, the New York District Attorney, years after, I mean, think about this, it's 2024, they're alleging that this happened in 2015, 11, or, you know, 11 years ago that this, ha or nine years ago that this happened. I'm sorry, my math isn't great. Uh, and suddenly, that a, a, an issue that was passed over by our Department of Justice that was looked at and let go by the Federal Election Commission, suddenly the New York District Attorney, who, by the way, his predecessor, Cy Vance, the district attorney before the current one, also passed on this case. When Alvin Bragg, the current DA, first came into office, he passed on this case. 
And it wasn't until a Biden attorney was put in the office of the district attorney that they suddenly took up the case. So it's important to understand the context of what's really starting today and the idea that the first witness was the publisher of a media company that supposedly didn't publish st stories about uh, some of these bad things was their lead person tells you a lot about what we're really dealing with. This isn't a serious crime. This is a waste of the court's time. This is a waste of President Trump's time. And this is what has been called in America lawfare. This is using the judicial system against President Trump. Well, Donald Trump's uh, team says the uh, prosecution's main witness against him is Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen. And they say, well, look, you can't trust him because he often said uh, he's often said he hates Donald Trump. Uh, he wants him to go to jail. Wants to see him in an orange jumpsuit and all that. I don't know if you've met uh, Michael Cohen. Is he oh, trustworthy? I, I, <laughs> Andrew, I've I've met Michael Cohen on countless occasions uh, during the 2015 2016 campaign. Uh, I would never use trustworthy and Michael Cohen in the same sentence. I probably wouldn't use it in the same book. He's not the kind of guy that I would. <laughs> you know, trust for in any in any kind of deal or, or comment or whatever. Um, I am one of those guys, I've always said that my word is my bond and those, the, you know, those kind of people where you can trust what they say. Michael Cohen will tell eight people 10 different stories. Uh, and so I think this is what they're really going to go after tomorrow. The fact that Michael Cohen has been on both sides of an issue, which side are you going to actually believe? The person in this case, um, Stormy Daniels, who they're going after, signed an affidavit, a legal document, saying that there was no relationship. So the question that I think they're going to pose is, well, what story are you actually going to believe? Because you've got a bunch of people who are now admitted liars. They've been convicted of this. Stormy Daniels signed a legal document on one hand saying that nothing happened. Michael Cohen testified that certain things occurred that didn't. He went to jail. He's been convicted for perjury, for lying. And so now the prosecution is going to claim that he's the star witness. It's just the, the whole case is really incredible. But I just wonder whether justice is possible, um, Sean, because many of the jurors, for instance, even the ones that uh, Trump eventually agree to have on the... Because they both get... Both sides get picks as to who they, are, they want on the jury and who they don't. Many of the jurors said they got their news from the New York Times among other sources. That paper's so viciously anti-Trump. What are the chances of a fair trial if that's the, the, shaping their worldview? Well, look, in the borough of Manhattan where this is taking place, Donald Trump had got 12% of the vote. 80, almost 86% voted against, you know, for Joe Biden. And then obviously there's a couple other third-party candidates in there. But this is a place that is very hostile to Donald Trump. So the reason they read the New York Times is because they're all liberals um, and that they watch MSNBC and a bunch of these other channels. But for most of these people, we saw those couple jurors, jurors come back after they were initially picked saying, I can't be fair. I can't do this. A lot of these people being dismissed right off of the bat because they admitted they, they, don't, they didn't want Donald Trump to get a fair trial. They wanted him to convict him. And this is what's going to be, you know, unbelievably challenging is that you're having it in an environment where most people just, with, regardless of the facts, regardless of the statute of limitations and the charges, we're going to vote him guilty of anything that they put in front of him. Sean Spicer, thank you so much indeed for your time. Always a pleasure to be with you, Andrew. Thank you. After the break, a senator has just posted the stabbing footage that Anthony Albanese wants to ban. And a Labor minister wants to fund Aboriginal autonomy with a new tax. A new apartheid coming up. I'm joined now by my regular Tuesday guest, National Senator Matt Canavan, the former Resources Minister, just fresh back from picking up his son from training. Matt Canavan, good to see you. Look, uh, there's this video of the Christian bishop being stabbed last week in his church. The opposition leader, Peter Dutton, uh, backs the attempts to ban it, which is odd to me. Uh, but now you've got uh, another senator, Ralph Babbitt, uh, who's posted it on his Twitter feed. Ralph is, of course, from the United Australia Party, um, with an, well, a fornicate you message to the government and to its chief censor. What do you make of this? Is this just attention-seeking or, or an important point? Well, look, I, I chose not to post the video. I, I thought about it, Andrew, but I didn't. Uh, uh, but I, I think there's a couple of more important points to make about uh, whether or not Ralph should have posted or not. One is 
he also posted it to Instagram. And I just checked before coming to air and it's still up there. And, and the e-safety commissioner and the government's been saying, oh, Twitter hasn't complied uh, with his nose to take down this video, but Facebook and, and Instagram have. Well, uh, Ralph's video's up there. In fact, if you search Facebook, it comes up straight away. And so what, what is going on here? It, it seems something else is going on. And the other point I'd like to make is that, I mean, Ralph wouldn't even have posted this video if it wasn't for the Prime Minister having this ridiculous over-the-top reaction to this situation. Uh, yes, the video is is violent, uh, uh, but many more people have seen it now because the Prime Minister has made such a big issue of that. I mean, meanwhile, petrol prices are over 130 cents, sorry, 230 cents a litre in most cities, and, and the Prime Minister's focused on social media videos. What's going on? And, Andrew, it seems to me here that the distraction is actually the point, that the Prime Minister is happy to distract attention away from the broader issue here that, that, that was starting to be discussed about our, our multicultural society. And this ultimately was an attack, uh, an attack inspired by radical Islam uh, viewpoints against well, a we Christian don't know that, so We don't know that. The Prime Minister seems more, seems more concerned about the publication of the video than the actual attack on a Christian bishop. And he is perhaps successfully, perhaps the point, uh, avoided a, a more important discussion here uh, about how we integrate as a multicultural society and not have this kind of violence uh, uh, interrupt church services in our nation. Well, why the uh, bishop was stabbed is, of course, for a court to decide. We don't know the uh, motivation, uh, really. That's for a court to decide. But, yes, there were questions to ask about multiculturalism, particularly after the Assyrian Christian riot afterwards, etc., uh, and all that kind of stuff. And it's been completely hijacked. You're quite, quite correct. Um, can I uh, move you to Victoria? This really is disturbing. Victoria, the Victorian Labor government is negotiating, uh, plans to negotiate a treaty with... Uh, an unrepresentative uh, First Nations, First Peoples Assembly, its version of the voice, elected by fewer than 10% of people identifying as Aborigines in Victoria. She says it should include giving Aborigine, uh, people identifying as Aboriginal a share of the money from green energy projects and from mining, all that beyond the handouts and social services already paid through for through mining royalties. Now, what do you make of this? Well, look, I actually have no problem with uh, some of the wealth generated by projects going back to local people. If those local people are Indigenous people, sure, but so should non-Indigenous people get it as well. I, I don't think we should somehow divide our society based on skin colour or race. Uh, uh, that, that is racist and we shouldn't do that. But I fully support projects uh, delivering back to, to local communities, be they Indigenous or non-Indigenous. The issue here, though, in, ca in the case of renewable energy, where is this wealth being created? Because almost every renewable energy project in the country requires massive amounts of government subsidies. So, so <laughs> where's, the, where's the pie to split up here with the local community? That just means, presumably, this means that if, oh. if the costs of these projects go up more by having to pay out some money to Indigenous groups, that means the government subsidy is going to have to increase. No, so you're going to have to pay you for make it a more. Very so there's no wealth point. to be divided here at all. No, let them, let them subsidise it then. That's the point. Matt Canavan, we'll have a longer talk to you next week. Thank you so much for your time. That's it from me. Coming up next, Danica DiGiorgio filling in for Sherry.